haven't seen people. Five bag of two. All right, guys, are we ready? All right, we're penultimate. So let's we'll put yeah, back to. All right. And if the air is too cold, y'all need to turn it back on. Already said. Thank you so much. Project. I'm going to be talking about glacial lake growth and outburst flood risk in the Southern Andes. Um, I graduated uh, from the University of South Carolina uh, last year, and I'll be working with Pablo Iribarren at University of Australia in Valdivia. So I want to talk a little bit, I guess, intro to my background um, in glaciology research. I first got into it um, a summer at the University of Alaska, where I was studying mass balance modeling, and I was applying a Python-based model. Um, modeling individual glaciers and their mass change over time, as well as projecting into the future at the end of the century. Um, the model had previously been applied in High Mountain Asia, and I took it to apply uh, in the Alaska and Yukon region. Um, after that study, I just got more interested and continued working with that group in Alaska on mass distribution curves, which essentially shows where ice is distributed along the length of the glacier. And we were looking to see if there were distinct uh, regional differences in those uh, mass distribution curves in order to apply the model with uh, less uncertainty in our results. Um, and following that, I spent a summer working on marine ice shelf instability, which focuses on the height of ice cliffs in large ice sheets like Antarctica and Greenland, um, and looking to <laughs> measure them using remote sensing tools so that we can um, start to understand uh, why these ice shelves are retreating rapidly and uh, the grounding line where the ice meets the land um, is retreating as well, which is contributing to things like sea level rise um, due to uh, the retreat of those ice shelves in Antarctica and Greenland. Um, during this time, I was also, I spent a couple months here in Chile studying abroad um, in 2020 um, and unfortunately had to leave due to COVID. <laughs> um, but during that time, I learned about uh, glacial lake outburst floods, which led to um, my proposal for my undergraduate thesis, which was on um, glacial lake outburst flood effects in Patagonia, and specifically in the Explorers Valley um, in northern Patagonia. And that's where I began my collaboration with Dr. Iribaren at University of Australia. He was my second reader on my undergraduate thesis, um, and I learned a lot from him in that process. Um, I wanted to work further, um, which led to my being here. <laughs> um, and the second thing I wanted to talk about was music, because I see it as a companion practice to my research. It's another a creative process as I think research is as well um, and helps me to doing each one I think helps me to do the other even better um, so anyway here's a picture I have a this was the first glacier I ever went on which was Root Glacier in Kennecott Alaska um, and really jump started my interest in glaciers um, that's me with my violin and that's the EP I released a few days ago um, so yeah glaciers and music <laughs> Um, and so, this is the lab we'll be working at, Glacier Geography Lab at Universidad Austral. Um, I'll be working in La Villa Chile with um, Pablo, my host, who is right here. Um, and I'll be working in the Geoinformatics Lab at the University Campus, which is focused on glacial lake change. So I'll be working with other students looking at how glacial lakes are uh, forming and changing and growing in um, the northern and southern Andes. Um, and hopefully I might get to do some field work towards the end of my nine months. Um, I was hoping to come here even earlier, but since I found out the last minute, <laughs> I unfortunately wasn't able to. But the summer comes back around again, luckily for me. <laughs> so um, hopefully I'll be able to actually go to explore the glacier and perhaps some other sites um, and learn a bit more about loss in, um, in the region. Um, oh, one other thing I wanted to mention um, was the importance of citizen science in this uh, geography lab and working with um, people who interact with the glacier environment on a daily basis. Um, and another big goal is, is producing low-cost monitoring systems for the lakes and rivers nearby in these communities um, to better understand how they're changing um, and what might trigger these flooding events. I don't know why that map of Alaska is there, but <laughs> is it there? Yeah, it yeah. is. Strange. Uh, okay. 
Um, anyway, I'm going to talk about glacial lake growth in the Southern Andes, which is what my project is going to focus on. And just a little bit of background on why it's so important. Um, the Patagonian Andes are actually experiencing the largest negative mass balance of all Andean glaciers. Um, so they're changing really fast, and uh, that is having a huge effect on the environment. Um, and globally, the Southern Andes actually have the most negative specific mass change, meaning it's losing the most ice um, between 1961 and 2016. So the glaciers are changing, and of course, this impacts the glacier lakes. Um, so the figure below um, from Wilson et al. in 2018, which was a study on the uh, Central and Patagonian Andes um, glacier lakes in those regions, um, is showing an increase in the number of glacier lakes, as well as in the um, volume and area of those lakes. And so I'm going to talk about now glacial lakes and glacial lake outburst floods. Um, so on the bottom here, you can see a cross-sectional view of a glacier lake. And this is a typical moraine-bound lake where the glacier um, pushes up all of the sediment, forms the terminal moraine, and then upon retreating, leaves behind the meltwater, which is bound, the lake itself is bound by that moraine, um, which, as you can see from the figure, is generally, um, as opposed to the bedrock, it's finer sediments. It's more easily deformed. Um, and can uh, break down over time. Um, and so the top picture is showing a variety of ways in which a, an outburst flood can occur. Um, one, is, uh, one way is rock fall um, from the surrounding mountains. You could have an avalanche um, from snow in the mountains. You'd have calving, which is breaking off of ice from the glacier itself, causing displacement of water um, from the lake, as well as waves. Those waves could also be caused by seismic activity. So one <laughs> difficult thing when it comes to prediction is that there are so many uh, ways in which these floods can occur. Um, and upon the flood occurring, um, you can also get a buildup of sediment causing a landslide, um, which can be dangerous and uh, devastating to um, infrastructure and communities downstream. Um, another, uh, there are two other, I guess, regimes of these lakes, um, not only marine bound, but you can have a uh, rock bar dam or you can have an ice dam where the lake is actually on top of the ice or it's barred by the ice itself. So melting of that ice and um, building water pressure can cause a breaking of that type of dam. Um, and interestingly enough, these can actually drain and refill over time. Um, so one good example of that is in the Colonia River Valley. Um, there's an ice dammed lake that didn't flood very often until uh, one large flood occurred, um, I believe in 2015. And since then, the lake actually floods several times a year. Um, so it's completely changing the regime of that flooding um, and the way that people need to adapt to that flooding regime. Um, yeah, that's about it. Um, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about Explorer Lars Glacier, since that was the um, site that I was studying during my thesis. Um, the picture on the top left um, is a road to the glacier which actually had to be rebuilt um, due to a flood that occurred in 2018 that formed a lake called Laguna Espontania. Um, so you can see just by the name, it is sudden. It is, uh, and it really, it really impacts the landscape. Um, so they had to rebuild this road. It really impacted travel to the glacier, impacted tourism, which is um, the main uh, economic driver of the local community there. Um, on the bottom left is the map I created during my thesis, which is really small, but it has different um, sites of tourism along the Explorers Valley, and those were sites that were significantly impacted by this lake and, and access to those areas. Um, and then on the right, I have two photos which are actually of the same ice cave, although the bottom picture you might not be able to call that a cave anymore. <laughs> um, these were taken, I believe, about six weeks apart um, in November of 2021, or no, 2020, sorry. Um, and yeah, so this is just to show how quickly the glacier environment changes and how being there every day, like tour guides and, uh, and people that see the glacier every day, uh, that is very important um, because they change so quickly and uh, that's part of why it's important to, to learn from the people that see those changes on the ground. Um, so now getting into what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to start with a glacier lake inventory. Um, so I'm going to be using tools like Google Earth Engine, which allows you to analyze thousands of satellite images um, very quickly and uh, through like the internet, which is amazing because usually it takes up so much space. 
um, as, as well as ArcGIS. Um, and we'll use this procedure adapted from um, Sugar et al., which was published last year about um, automated delineation of glacial lakes. Um, so using that, I'll be able to produce a shapefile of validated glacier polygons to use in future research um, and hopefully help us better understand how glacier lakes are growing and changing. Um, and I hope that this data, you know, it's a small part of a much bigger project and hopefully will be useful to future studies related to glacier lakes and flooding. Um, so I also wanted to mention actually about Explorer Dice Glacier that a previous Fulbright student, Emma Gleeman, collected some data here along with um, my host, Pablo, um, that I actually used in my thesis, which was really cool. So hopefully we can continue that uh, passing down of information in the future. Um, and the second main part of my project is hazard assessment modeling. Um, and there are a few different options that I explored during my thesis um, that I would like to further explore now. Um, I don't need to go really into details, uh, but most of them are ArcGIS integrated um, and can uh, give us an idea of how at risk different lakes are of flooding. So at the bottom left here is a, an image just sort of showing an example of what that looks like, where you can identify the, the lakes that are at high risk or at extremely high risk um, based on different factors, um, like those triggering events I discussed earlier, avalanche, rockfall, seismic activity, et cetera. Um, and this study was actually done by uh, my supervisor when I was working in Alaska um, and someone who developed one of these uh, uh, hazard models. Um, and this is actually in Nepal, and a lot of um, high mountain Asia and uh, the Himalayas have a longer history of studying these uh, glacial lake outburst floods. Um, so hopefully developing these kinds of maps for the Southern Andes and South America in general will help advance the research done in this area, as it is now one of the uh, largest uh, or fastest changing glacial environments. Um, and then there's potential further exploration. Um, field work at Explorer Doris Glacier right here is um, some ablation stakes on the surface of the glacier, which basically helps measure the elevation change over time um, and melting. Um, and then Universidad de la Frontera is um, a school in Temuco, which is a few hours outside of Valdivia, which is where I'll be staying most of the time. Um, but I also hope to visit um, Temuco and learn from um, there's a group of civil engineers there um, working also on engineering solutions and uh, how to manage the uh, increasing flooding in the future, um, which is not so much what my project is on. I don't know much about how to fix the problem, <laughs> more how to understand it and, and uh, see the changes, um, but it's definitely interesting to explore uh, how they, um, how potential solutions, what they would look like. Um, and one other thing I wanted to mention is, of course, this is a study on a more urgent and apparent risk of, of flooding, which is obviously a huge danger, a huge risk. Um, but on top of that, there's a long-term effect of uh, losing this freshwater resource, uh, glaciers and, and glacial lakes and the rivers associated with them that transport the freshwater. So, um, so it has long-term implications, and hopefully the understanding of how the lakes are changing will not only impact um, our understanding of those urgent events, but also the long-term effects. Um, yeah, and I had a bunch of other notes that I maybe didn't get to, but hopefully in a conversation discussion, we'll discuss it more. <laughs>